In this section, we're going to explore the wonderful world of transitions with D3. Transitions, or specifically animations, in a visualization can be extremely impactful and helpful to the viewer if used appropriately. Since the human eye is trained to notice and track movement, adding transitions to a graph or chart can be a great way to focus a user's attention on a specific change or data point. D3 makes transitions to our visualizations relatively painless. But, as with anything, there are a few gotchas to watch out for. In this first video, we'll start slowly by just covering the basics of creating transitions and tweaking different parameters to explore the subject. Once we've mastered the basics, we'll incorporate what we've learned into our previous scatterplot visualization to round out this section. For today's game plan, we're going to look at how to change a transition using duration, delay, and ease. We'll also explore some idiosyncrasies, such as chaining one transition after another, as well as transitioning from one shape to another. We'll then conclude by doing a fade-out transition and removing an element from the canvas. So let's get started with our basic template that we can use as our background for experimenting with transitions. To the HTML part, let's just set the title to Playing with Transitions and add a div with ID of Canvas for our SVG Canvas. In the main script, let's just add a simple shape, say a rectangle, to our canvas to use as our guinea pig. Save that and load it in the browser just to make sure we haven't forgotten the basics. Now, in order to trigger our transition, we'll need some event to fire that we can listen for. Since we're already familiar with buttons and on-click events, let's use that. First, we need to add our button to the HTML. After that, the simplest transition we can do is to alter one of the attributes of our red rectangle. So let's create a callback function for when the button is clicked. In the click handler, change the x value to 400 on our rectangle. Reload the page, then click the button to see what happens. The rectangle jumps 400 pixels to the right. Now let's call the transition method in between where we select our element and change its x attribute. Reload and hit the transition button to see this in action. Did you see the square run across the page instead of jump there? So, what D3 is doing under the hood is interpolating the x attribute values over a period of time. The default here happens to be 250 milliseconds, or a quarter of a second. If we refresh the page, then look in our inspector and highlight our rectangle, then click our transition button, we can see the x values quickly update. Don't blink, or you might miss the changes. As I mentioned, the default duration for an animation is 250 milliseconds, but we can easily change that with the duration method. So let's try changing this to 1 second or 1000 milliseconds and view the results in the browser. The changes in the x value are now a bit easier to watch go by. We can also add a delay to our animation. Say we want to wait for a second before our animation starts. This is also just another method with the name of, you guessed it, delay. If we test this in the browser, the square doesn't start moving until a second after the button was clicked. The final aspect of a transition that will change is the easing, which describes the path or timing of the transition. You can think of it as a predetermined animation pattern. If we look at the transition documentation on the D3 wiki, we can see that we have a lot of choices for easing. So let's change this to elastic using the ease method in our transition. Like the previous two methods, delay and duration, the ease method is set with a default value. The default duration is 250 milliseconds, with the default delay being zero. Similarly, the default easing is cubic in out, which speeds up and slows down the movement from zero to 400 pixels. So let's refresh our browser and see our elastically moving cube in action. Hey, that was neat. The square went past the 400 pixel point, then bounced back and forth around 400 before settling into place. 
It's as though it were tethered to the location with an elastic band. So, now that we're getting a bit more comfortable with our transitions, let's say we want to transition our red square to green after it had moved. Here is where things begin to get a bit more complicated. If we simply add this method chained to our previous code, refresh our browser, and hit the button, we'll notice that both transitions happen at the same time. That's not exactly what we were going for. A naive implementation of this would be to utilize the delay method and add two transitions on the same object. We can test this, and it will work. But this is not the most elegant solution, as it requires us to predict how long the previous transition takes. Imagine we have five animations in a row, all with different durations. Now things start to become a bit more complicated. A better way of doing this is to take advantage of D3's each function and listen for the end event of our transition. Every transition has both a start and an end event, which are fired at the beginning and the end of the transition. We can listen for these and use them to call whatever code we want, including another transition. Hooray! Now let's say we want to transition our square into a circle. This is not quite as easy as it sounds. A transition only works on attributes and styles. Unfortunately, there is no attribute or style for our shape property. The shape instead is defined by the element itself. A workaround for this is to apply a border radius to our square to make it appear to be a circle. If we set the Rx and Ry properties to half the width and height respectively, we'll achieve the desired effect. So let's refresh our browser and test this. There seems to be a problem here. Instead of a nice smooth transition from non-rounded corners to rounded ones, the animation just chopped off the corners. The reason for this, and a common pitfall when starting to use transitions, is that there is no initial Rx and Ry value for our rectangle. D3 doesn't know how to interpolate the values from non-existent to 50 and thus forces the final transition value. We could fix this in one of two ways. We could go back to where we created our rectangle and add Rx and Ry attributes with initial values of 0. Or we could utilize our start function and set them to 0 there. Let's try the latter. Now if we test this, we see... Voila! A nice smooth transition from a rectangle to a circle. Finally, we'll use everything we've learned so far to create a third step to our animation. Have our now green circle fade out and remove itself from the canvas. We'll do this by initializing an opacity value in our start function to 1. Then we'll create a second end function to fire when the second transition ends. The second ending will transition the opacity from 1 to 0 and use the remove method to delete it from the canvas. D3 is smart enough to wait for the transition to complete before removing the element. So now let's refresh our browser and we'll see the lovely dance of our square in its entirety. We should now feel confident with using the D3 transition API. Besides a few potential complications to watch out for, it was relatively painless. In the next couple of videos, we'll see how our chart can benefit from some transitions.